Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hallelujah. Everyone that is at home, just want to let you know that it is Easter Sunday and that we are loving you and missing you so much. Yes, amen. And for those that are not able to make it here, we ask that you, we ask our, our church family, do your part. I start a watch party. Share this video to your friends. Let someone that is, has no hope, let's spread hope around this place this morning. Let's, let's, spread, let's spread hope around the world this morning because today is a, is a special day. I know a lot of people put, we put Christmas really high, but that was just the beginning of God's purpose. Easter, we celebrate the fulfillment of God's purpose. He died for all mankind that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. We want to remind you before we get started this morning that uh, Brother Terry will be putting up a link for online giving. Don't let your blessings remember to still tithe and to give to the church that we may be able to stand in this, this troubled time. This morning I ask that our pastor has petitioned us to do something very special from 12 to 2 o'clock. He's petitioned us from this week and next Sunday, from 12 to 2 o'clock, that we get on our knees and let's spend time praying. When he wants us, if your last name begins A through M, he wants you to take the 12 to 1 o'clock portion, and he wants those that are from N to Z, your last name begins N to Z, so he wants you to pray from 1 to 2 o'clock. We ask that we bind together against some specific prayers. Number one, we're going to pray against COVID-19. How is it affecting our world? We're going to pray against it. And when you pray, he said, anything you ask in my name, and you pray in Jesus' name, then it shall be done. So we pray in Jesus' name. We want to pray for our economy because as much as we don't want to talk about it, these things are being affected by this virus and things need to change. Uh, we also want to, the president came across the, the news and he said that he's about to have to make a decision. I'm not sure what it was, but we as a church, as the, the body of Christ, we want to bind together because we want to pray for our leaders because they affect what we do. And that we want to pray for them that God's will be done. Amen. A lot of times we pray our own will, but we want to pray for God's will to be done. And uh, if you don't have anything else to do this morning, when you're sitting at home, Many people are depressed right now because this is, I know my wife is sitting at home. And this is the first Easter Sunday she's sitting at home. But for many people, That's right. many this is the first Easter Sunday yes. that many people are not attending church. We want to pray for that need. That is a very real need. Yes. More people visit churches on Sunday, on Easter Sunday than any other holiday in the world. This is a very important, the enemy would very much like us to sit quiet and do nothing. But I come against him in the name of Jesus and we are going to do something for Jesus. Yes. I have a little reading that was sent to me and I would like to share it with you. It's Easter weekend. The building is empty. The parking lot is empty. The seats are empty. The Sunday school classrooms, they're empty. The aisles are empty. The foyer is empty. The sound booth and the, the camera, the camera crew, they're mostly empty. Pastor's offices, they're empty. The sanctuary is empty. And if I dwelt on it long enough, my heart can kind of feel a little empty. But, there's a big but here. It's Easter Sunday. The tomb is empty. God is still working. The church is still conquering. Families are back praying and parents are back to guiding. Children are learning. Hearts are turning. The body is believing and the musicians are playing. The faithful are still singing. The pastor is still preaching. And the Lord is still reaching for the world. The saints are still ministering. And here's the final, the final word in Jesus is still living. This morning, don't let this situation dictate what God has for you this morning. This morning in your living room, in your home, in your car, no matter where you are, lift up a sound.
you just take your hands and put them up. If you're driving, just cut up one hand. Why don't you take the time right now just to love the Lord? It's Easter Sunday morning. Thank you, Lord. That's because of the cross that we have, the hope that we have today. It's because of the cross that we have the ability to walk into the presence of God. Prior to the cross, you had to go before a, a priest and you had to spend time dealing with him, but now you have direct access to the throne of God yourself. Thank you, Lord, for the great sacrifice that you paid. Thank you, Lord, for paying a ransom for my soul. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory to God. We worship you right now. We magnify you above everything else, oh God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, we bless your name. We bless your name. Jesus, your word. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Wow, what an exciting time to serve God. What an exciting time to be in the house of God. We're missing every one of you this morning. We're wishing that you was here with the seats filled and, and enjoy the presence of God here. But I just believe that this morning you are enjoying the presence of God where you Amen. are. Amen. If you haven't already, I wish that you would just, if you're kind of surfing the internet right now and kind of keeping up with us maybe on your TV, that you would uh, take time to, to just to settle down for a minute, put all the distractions aside. Just kind of lean into me for just a few minutes here. And I want to talk to you about the miracle of heaven. I want to talk to you about the miracle of heaven. And aren't you glad you live in a day and a time of miracles? I think about all the issues that we're up against here in this nation and, and uh, how that we're all kind of getting uncomfortable and we're all wishing that this would pass. And I believe we need to pray for that. I believe that we need to begin to bear down and pray. We, we spent time humbling ourselves. We spent time in praying that God would help us and heal our nation. But I just believe that it's time to begin to now take a step of faith and begin to pray down the things that we desire for God to do. To pray into place the things that we need. As Brother John said while ago in his opening remarks, the president has a very tough decision, and he's asked for God's people to intercede for him, to pray for him. And I believe that it is our responsibility to begin to pray for our leaders, not just the president, but the vice president and those advisors that are around them, that they would hear from God and they would not hear the voice of the enemy that would do its best to destroy and take down the economy of this nation. I was telling Brother John before service, I said, let me tell you, this nation is built upon Christ and God founded this nation so that we would be able to reach down and to be able to help those nations that are in need. We are the financial backbone that helps push the gospel across the world. We are the people that stand for those who have injustices done in their lives. And I believe that it is God's purpose and plan for this nation to help the others. And I believe that it would be the prize of the enemy to take down the very financial thing that has been able to help others. But I believe God is repositioning us. He is helping us to turn from our inward thought process. Help me, bless me, give to me, all that thought process. And he's beginning to restructure us. To be able to minister to others and open up our resources and be willing to give and to bless and to help not just our home and not just our church, but this nation and the people across the world. I'm so thankful that he's entrusted us with that right there. Thank you, Lord. I want to turn your attention this morning to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and while you're finding that, we're going to be going to verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. I got to tell you, it's a little bit strange to not have some type of production going up here this morning. We've all become so accustomed to that. But I want you to know that the presence of God is in the house. And we don't, we don't need a production. It's like a friend of mine that was a musician, and he used to play, he used to wear a shirt that said, I'm playing for an audience of one. I think if we could ever get that in our thought process, 
that we're not here to entertain everybody else, yeah. but we are here to worship the one true living God yes. that he be lifted up and brought close to us. Thank you, Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And I will stop along the way here and say some comments <clears throat> as I begin to preach. But it says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Maybe I could better say it this way. The same Spirit, the same amount of power that resurrected Jesus Christ out of the tomb right. is available for you and I. Amen. The same power that resurrected our Savior from a dead spot in his life that he had come to the end of his physical being, that same power is now dwelling inside of you and I. It was not just a one-time deal or, or something to only be hoped for on some distant day, but I want to let you know that today God is desiring to dwell inside of you and I. God's looking for a place that he can come and he can be a part of our lives if we are willing to allow that. And I can't think of a greater privilege than having the power of God living inside of me. Amen. Paul, the writer of the book of Romans, was telling us that the same power is not only available to us, but it has the ability to reside inside of us. Yes. God's always wanted his power to be working in our lives. God's wanted to see what the power of God working in us gives us the ability to do. It could raise to life dead things that are in your life. There's things that's in your world that has died. Oh, you might be physically alive, but there are some things in your life that God has said, I would like to raise back up in you. Maybe it's a dream that you had that you have long forgotten about and you buried it. But God's saying there's some power operating inside of you when you are filled with my spirit that I can resurrect the very things that you are wanting to see done that you have long since forgotten about. Before we go any further, I'd, I'd, I'd like to just read the remaining part of this verse and make an application. I want you to think of a place that you've had death happen in your life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe you're estranged from a child. Maybe you're estranged from a parent. Maybe you're sitting somewhere this morning and you just happened to cross this broadcast and you're thinking to yourself, should I take another step? Or maybe this is the day that I'm going to end it all because I don't feel like I have any hope. I come to tell you this morning, there is hope and there is life and it is more abundant. And God will raise back to life the very thing that you have thought was dead and gone. And there was no more hope that you had no more reason to live, that you had no more reason to go forward. But God saying, I've got all the reason in the the world for you to keep moving forward right. when something in your life isn't right you might be thinking in this particular area it can only be fixed by a miracle but I want to continue it says he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken that's not a word we use a lot anymore but it actually means make alive so let me say it this way from the, the he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Yes. You might be dealing with sickness this morning. Uh -huh. You might be dealing with sickness this morning. You're thinking, oh, I don't know if I can make it through this. Well, I want you to know that God's spirit dwelling inside of you will make alive your mortal body. Yeah. So I want to summarize it in this statement. We cannot only celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ but you can experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. Yes. The great miracle that religion has shrouded and the holiday celebration has maybe hidden to the world is that in 2020, there is much more to this day than Easter dresses and Easter hats and Easter egg hunts and family dinners. There's much more to it than all of that. Right. 
I heard someone say this to me one time. They said, death is so final. Death is so final. And yet the power of God raised Jesus back to life. Death, hell, and the grave was defeated in one quick swoop. Therefore, there's nothing in your life that the power of God cannot conquer. There's nothing in your life that the power of God cannot make whole again. There's nothing in your life that the power of God cannot once again make strong. I, I want to tell you that, that I want to remind you, Brother Kilman, he often reminds us on Sunday nights, but Sister Luann was given only weeks to live, at best maybe a couple months to live, when she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer some four and a half years ago. But God intervened, and today she is still doing wonderful. She's still walking, she's going to work every day. In the middle of all of this virus, she's still at work every day doing her job. That's because there is something about Jesus Christ operating inside of you that will begin to raise up some life where death has been pronounced over you. I'm reminded, and I tell this story sometimes, but when I was just a boy, I had leukemia. And, and, and back in those days, there wasn't all the treatment of leukemia that they have today. And my mother took me to the doctor. She knew something was wrong. I had bruises and large knots that would keep coming up all over my body. I would barely fall and I would begin to bruise. She knew it wasn't right. She took me to the doctor in Houston where they lived at. And, and she took me in there and he did some blood work and did some tests. And he came back and he said, Miss Crum, we need to take this young boy into the doctor or into the hospital right now. We've got to begin to treat him because he has leukemia. And God, or, and he said, we can try to work with him while we have him here. She said, will just a few days make a difference? And he said, probably not. It won't. She said, I want to go back to Lake Charles. I want to go back to my, my home church. I want them to pray for him there. I want them to believe God for him there. That maybe God just might do a miracle for him. She returned home for the weekend. And when she got there that evening, the Holy Ghost began to move in the service. And, and she had full plans to have me prayed for. But in the midst of all of that, her father, who was 57 years old, suddenly raised his hands and surrendered his life to God and all of a sudden was filled with the Holy Ghost in that spot right there. And she was so excited because she had lived her entire life with her father not living for God. And all of a sudden, she got caught up in the moment and, and service ended and she got in the car and they was on their way home. And she said, oh, I forgot to have my boy prayed for. Oh, what am I going to do? And her mother just said, let's just my they got me home, they undressed me, they looked at me. Not a bruise, not a knot, wow. nothing on my body, nowhere at all, perfectly clear, perfectly clean. And the next morning, Monday morning, she was back in Houston, ready to check me into the hospital. The doctor said, let me take another test. I, I, I don't know what's happened here, but, but it looks like there's been a change. And he, he ran more tests and he came back. My mom said he literally came running down the hall. He said, I don't know what you did this weekend. I don't know where you went. But all I want to say is this child has no leukemia Hallelujah. in his body at all. He is completely whole. Hallelujah. There's no problem. I want you to know this morning that God, the same spirit that dwelled in Christ Jesus, and raised him from the dead. It keeps the working in your life. It'll heal you. It'll restore you. And it'll raise you up. Yeah. As great as that is. There's something that's even greater than that. I want to show you another spot in the word of God. Jesus ministry had become so popular. It had become so, so well known. That he couldn't possibly meet all the needs physically of the people that was there. The scripture says that, that his, him and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. They was overwhelmed with people wanting their needs met. They was overwhelmed with people wanting their children healed and their bodies healed and, and their lives restored and devils cast out of them. And so suddenly the Lord decided, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 70 of the disciples. You thought there was just 12, but there was more than 12. The scripture says here that there was 70 and he split them up two by two, two, and he sent them out, and he gave them instructions to go out into the cities and to begin to heal the sick people, begin to reach out, cast out devils, and do all these things. 
And so they did. And the scripture says in Luke 10, verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Well, there's something powerful about the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. That's the name I want to be identified with yes. until my dying day. Yes. I want to make sure that name's called over me. I want to make sure that name is over my life, over my family's life. They realize that when they said the name of Jesus Christ, that all of a the sudden there was some power that broke loose. And so they're telling the Lord this, and, they, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. In other words, what Jesus was saying to them was this right here. He said, listen, I know what you did was great, but I want to tell you that I've seen Satan fall from heaven as quick as lightning. He don't have the power to overwhelm you. He don't have the power to tell you what to do. Quit saying the devil made me do it. Quit thinking those thoughts. Instead, stand up and use the power of God to operate in your life. And say, I'm taking authority over these things. Quit letting the devil run over your children. Quit letting the devil run over your husband and your wife and your job. And say, I'm taking authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Satan doesn't have the power. God cast him out a long time ago and told him to have no more power to operate like he thinks he does. He's deceiving you. The scripture said he would deceive the nations. Right. He went on to say, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Look at your neighbor. Look at the person sitting next to you. Look at the person drinking coffee with you right now and say, he's given me power over all the power of the enemy. Not a little bit, not one little section, not one little segment, not one little thing. He's given you power over everything right. the enemy has put in your way, everything he's put in the way of this nation, everything he's put in the way of the world. He's given us power and authority over those things. And he said, and nothing, whew, this is a word for us today, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I think there was a president, President Kennedy, if I'm not mistaken. Might have been Roosevelt, I can't remember, but he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The fear that you feel, the fear that is is." overwhelming your thought process during all of this craziness that's going on. That's the spirit of the enemy. The scripture says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of a sound mind, of love. He's given you some things to counteract that thing. Don't be overwhelmed by that. God will take care of us. He goes on to say, I want you to, or I want you to pay attention to what happens next though. While they're high-fiving each other. <laughs> Woo! Can you see them running around, all 70 of them, telling their stories and, and, and fist bumping and high-fiving and all the things that they was doing? They're all trying to tell them, talk over one another how we do when we get excited. And yet Jesus suddenly gives them a however. You know, like, however. You ever had somebody rain on your parade like that? You, you're, you're carrying on, all of a sudden they go, however. Luke 10, 20 says, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. talking about Lord I'm sitting here casting out devils I am healing sick people blind eyes are opening deaf ears are unstopping heart disease is being healed withered hands are straightening out limp legs are beginning to take form again and walk again and you're telling me not to rejoice in that <laughs> don't rejoice in that the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yeah. It tells me that all the stuff that we do that we think is important, all the things that we do that we feel like is vitally important in this earth, and they might be, Jesus Christ is saying the most important thing is that your name is written in heaven. Right. That your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's more important than gathering wealth. It's more important than gathering possessions. It's more important than driving the finest car or living in the finest house or in the biggest neighborhood. Having your name written in the Word of God is vitally important. 
here at this church, we believe that there are great things that can happen in your physical life here and now, but it's not the greatest of all. We believe that there is something greater that can happen than the resurrection of earthly things. There is a power that is available to each of us today that is a resurrection from the pain and the suffering of the fallen world. And we are eternally with God in a place that's called heaven. With all the great miracles that can happen here on this earth, the truth of the matter is that every one of us are going to die one day. We don't like to talk about that. Pastor, that's not too positive. I want you to speak about something positive to me. Tell me something positive right now. Well, I'm 100% positive that all of us, unless the rapture takes us out of here, will die. Mm -hmm. Yet the reason that death doesn't sting the believer as much as the unbeliever is that we have a hope that lies within us that knows that there is much more to life than this short span that we spend here on this earth. Luke 12, 24 says, And I say unto you, my friends, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. You know, we always make sure we take care of our bodies. You know, I, I, I don't know how it works at your house. At my house, I shower twice a day. I, I recommend that. I don't know how it works at your house, but we take care of our bodies. We make sure that we're fed well. We go to the store, we buy something good to eat. We, we make sure we got ice to go in our cup to drink our, our, our water or our Coke or whatever it is that we're drinking. We go to the doctor to make sure that when we're sick that we get to feeling better. We wear a seatbelt when we go somewhere. We don't walk out in the middle of a lane of traffic and, and hope for the best. We wash our hands often. And after each time we use the restroom, can I get an amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> I have a little pastor right there going on. <laughs> Be clean. Wash your hands. Woo! Yeah. I can shout it up to it right there. Yet Jesus tells us that as important as self-preservation of the body is, that's not what you should have a healthy fear of. As important it is to make sure you have the right diet, that you take care of yourself, and that's important. Jesus said the thing that you need to have the most healthy fear of is what happens beyond this life. Right. You have to come into a relationship that makes the decision of where you spend eternity a real thing in your life. It's too often that we just kind of wander through life and float through life and, and just go about our daily routine and all of a sudden, one day 15's turn into 30 and 30 into 45 and 45 into 60. You're thinking what happened and the next thing you know you're knocking on death's door and you haven't made the right decisions for eternity 12 and 5 Luke 12 and 5 goes on to say but I forewarn you whom you shall fear fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell yea I say unto you fear him let me say it this way. If you would spend as much time taking care of your spirit man as you do your physical man, you wouldn't have to worry about what's going to happen beyond this life. That's right. If you spend as much time taking care of your temporal man that will only live 70 or 80 or maybe 90 years, as you do, uh, you do as much of your spiritual man as you do the temporal man, you wouldn't have to worry about all the problems that God was going to have to deal with you on when you step into the other side. What would Jesus Christ make such a, why would he make such a statement to us? Because he has seen both heaven and hell. He's the only one that can say, I know this is exactly what hell is like. He's seen what's there. He knows what's prepared. He knows what the enemy of your soul has prepared for you. And it's not good. It's not all the beautiful pictures that's painted here. But he knows that when you step through that small, thin veil that we call life, and you step into the other side, if you haven't made the proper preparations, it will be devastating. And it will be of hell. 
James 4 and 14 gives us a clear perspective of how we should see our life. This is what it says. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is life? It's a question mark. What is life? He's asking a question to you and I today when we read that. He's saying, listen to me. You don't know what tomorrow holds. For what is life? And then he answers it. It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. It's like a pot of water sitting on your stove that you got boiling and the steam begins to rise and you see the steam and, and, and if it might be rise this high and if it gets really hot, it might rise this high. But in just a matter of seconds, it dissipates and you don't see it anymore. Right. That's what happens with life. That's what happens with us. You come and you think, oh, I've got a long time to make a decision for Christ. Oh, I've got a long time to do something to get my life right with him. But the truth of the matter is that we only have moments to prepare ourselves. Jesus had a way of always refocusing folks on what really mattered, and that was eternity. Don't allow yourself to be overtaken with the cares of life and the desires to have a perfect life here and miss the big picture of what is happening on earth must also correspond with what happens in heaven. This is Jesus, John 14 and 1. He's speaking to the 12 disciples. They're discouraged. They're, they're, they're not having a good day. They're just like us. They're not, they're not super spiritual. They're not super special. They're just men, and they're following Christ the best that they can. And this day, they're discouraged. In John 14 and 1, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, I want you to weigh out what God's saying here. He's saying, don't worry about your troubles. I would think that, that you know, the master being a good master, he would say when they said, when they said man, we got problems, Lord. We're discouraged today. That he'd say, here, let me lay my hands on you and fix everything so your life's perfect. That's what we expect. But that's not what he said. He instead redirects them to a heavenly perspective. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. I told my mom this week, I was talking on the phone, talking about a lot of the world events that's going on right now. And, and, and it, just general events in our own lives and, and those kind of things. And I said, mom... The older I get, the more I understand. Hold on to life very loosely. Don't hang on to your possessions too tightly. Don't hang on to the things that you think is very important right now very tightly. Those things can disappear in moments. Your wealth can disappear in moments. Your health can disappear in moments. Your things, your possessions can disappear in moments. Instead, hang on to those things loosely, but hang on to Jesus Christ as tightly as you can. As long as you're with him, everything's going to be okay. He didn't say your junk would make it. He said you would make it. When you hang on to him, you're going to make it. Your stuff and my stuff might go away, but God said, I'll take care of you. This is the message I want to resonate with each of us today. And that is this, Jesus offers more than a better now. He offers a better place. Yes. He offers more than a better now. He offers a better place. When you have that hope, it changes the way you live. Yeah. It changes the way you walk. It changes the way you talk to people. It changes the way you dress. It changes the way you think. It changes the way everything about you. Because you realize, I'm not living for the moment. You, you, you're ignoring that wild hello. You only live once. You, you, you're pushing that out because you realize that my hope is beyond here. So I begin to think differently. When you have a life change because of your thought change, John 11, 25 says, Jesus said unto her, now he's talking to Mary, Mary and Martha, Martha in particular. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? 
He asked her a question. She had to come to a realization. I preached about this the other day. She had to make a decision. Do you believe I'm the resurrection and the life? Do you believe I'm the one that can save you? I can raise you. I can heal you. Do you believe this? That's why when you begin to understand that, you begin to believe that, all of a sudden, death doesn't have the sting that it had anymore. All of a sudden, you realize that, that I'm just transitioning, kind of, kind of like a child that transitions out of the womb of its mother and all of a sudden steps into life. When you leave this life, when you're buried, when, you, when we put away the old tent, the real you, the spirit you, that steps into it and is born into another world. Yeah. And how you prepare here depends on where you'll live there. There is an earth resurrection, a healing of our bodies, a healing of our minds, a healing of our families. But there is a better resurrection, and it's called heaven. It's today that our, our forefathers never had. I think about my cell phone, and, and I can do a thousand things with my cell phone that my, my forefathers never even dreamed of doing. I can push one button and... and, and Type in a few letters and numbers, and it'll take me plumb across the United States and tell me how long it'll take me to get there. I, I can pick up a, a dozen restaurants within five miles of me with just a click of a button on my phone because I understand that there are things that I have at my fingertips. But if you're not careful, those things, if you're not careful, those things will begin to distract you. They'll begin to blind you to what's really important. You'll get your hope in this life. You'll get your thought in this life. But you know, our forefathers, they, they, they had a way of seeing things differently. And I love today's music. I'll be the first one to tell you, I, I love today's music. I, I tell you all the time, I like black gospel music. That's, that's one of my favorite things. But I like today's modern music. I think it's wonderful. But I think about the songs our forefathers sang. I think about the things that they would do, you know. Uh, I, when I was preparing this, I was thinking about this particular pastor's wife that, that lives somewhere in the United States, and, um, and, and, and she used to play this piano, and it was, it was uh, one of those upright pianos, you know, ones that was real tall, and, and uh, the church was real small, and they would leave the windows open, and, and oh, she could sing loud. My goodness, I can remember parking two blocks down the street, and you could hear her. She'd sing loud and play that piano, and, and she didn't like play it, you know, like, I mean, it was like, but man, when she would open up and sing, she'd sing songs like, some glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away. She'd sing songs like, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. She, oh, there's something about that, she began to look somewhere else. Our forefathers, when they would sing, they weren't looking for all the things that we do today, but their eyes were focused on somewhere else. They'd say, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Woo. They was thinking, this world's not my home. Right. This place that I'm at, this is not the place that I'm dwelling at. I'm going somewhere beyond this place right here. They didn't have much to look forward here. They was poor. They lived in poor houses. They, they was known to live on the other side of the tracks. But there was something in them that said, I want to go someplace. Christ said this right here. Or Paul said this. He said, to live is Christ. Uh -huh. And to die is gain. Yeah. It was a no-lose situation for him. He said, I, I'm not looking to stay here. I didn't have much to come here for, but I'm looking for where I'm going to. The dazzle and the promise of bigger, better, bolder things has blinded us to the hope of heaven. That's where this is getting really good. I believe Jesus is telling us this Easter morning, I died, but I rose again. And I want you to know that if my spirit is in you, when you die, you will rise to the best life also. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, scripture often read at funerals. It said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brother, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The Lord was speaking through the pen of Paul, and he was saying, Listen, this is not death, this is asleep. 
He said, there's a hope beyond here. He said, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The scripture tells us to comfort one another with this. When, when your loved one's passing and they're filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't have to be sorrowful and cry. Oh, I understand we all feel sorry because we don't want to lose them, but they're simply stepping into another life. They're falling asleep here and awakening there in another bright tomorrow that God has already prepared for them. Religion has polluted the gospel message. Christ came to die and pay a price for our sins. He was resurrected and gave us the example of a new life that we can have through him. What an incredible exchange that you and I have. We can exchange a no good, sorry, worthless, beat down, depressed life for one in Jesus Christ. We don't have to face hell to pay for our sins. Someone said, what kind of God that loves you would send you to hell? You, you got the question wrong. You, you asked the wrong thing. You're asking what kind of God would send you to hell. Here's the situation. We all are sinned. The scripture said we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. The question or that, the thing is, are you going to pay for your sins forever in hell? Are you going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your life that he paid for your sins already? Right. See, it's not a matter of him sending you to hell. You decided, I don't want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my life, and therefore I'm willing to go pay for my own sins. Right. Scripture says you'll burn forever and ever and ever. You'll be in darkness forever and ever. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to accept the sacrifice that our Lord paid on the cross for our sins. That's what Easter is all about. That's what Good Friday was about. He died on the cross. He died and gave his life, but he rose to walk in a new life, in a new body, a resurrected body. The world's full of disappointments. The sting of trouble is a constant reminder of how truly weak we are. The world's looking for hope, and it's our job to tell the world that Jesus Christ brought us hope. God answers prayers. He answers miracles. He gives healings, deliverance. It's part of what we receive. But the most important thing that can happen in your world is that you are filled with the Spirit, that you receive Jesus Christ into your life. Right. Here's the reality. If you'll give your life to Christ and be born again, that's where the Spirit of life, the Spirit of God comes to dwell inside of you. Earth is as close to hell as you'll ever get. It only gets better from here. But the flip of that coin, so to speak, the other side of that page is this right here. If you refuse to give your life to Christ, earth is as close to heaven as you'll ever get. It only gets worse. And I'm closing. 1 John 5 and 11 says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written that believe in the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. There's a lot of people that believe in God. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus Christ. But it limits the road quite a bit when you start talking about that you believe Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I'm going to show you here in just a minute what it takes to make that happen. But we see in the scripture throughout the early church from the day of Pentecost through the end of the book of Acts that the only way to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ required some activation of more than just belief. The first thing that you have to do is you have to accept that you're a sinner. 
that you need Jesus Christ. As long as you don't humble yourself and you think you don't need a God or a Savior, you won't receive anything. But once you receive the understanding that you need Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the enemy keeps those that are away from God blinded so they don't even see they have a need of God. Next thing you've got to do is after you've acknowledged your sins, you have to repent of them. God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me. I want to be clean. I want to be made whole. I repent of every sin in my life. And, 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 and we, let's just do that right here. Let's just do that right now. Just say, Lord, forgive me right now. <clears throat> forgive me, Lord, of every evil thought that I've ever thought. Every evil word that I've ever spoken. Every evil deed that I have ever done. Every evil word that I have listened to. Every time I've aligned my spirit with the spirits of this world, I ask you to forgive me. Go ahead and repent right now. It's just It don't matter if how long you've lived for God or if you've never lived for God. Take the time right now. Lord, forgive me. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me completely whole. I believe that when you do that, that you are forgiven of your sins right then. And the scripture says, then you must be baptized. What does baptism do? Well, well, Peter told us in Acts, the second chapter, verse 38, that it washes away or it is for the remission. It cleans the record. The slate becomes clean behind you. Your sins have been forgiven, but now the slate is completely clean. It's clear when we're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Peter said to us, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And then he said, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful today that we have the ability to be able to, to join with Jesus Christ in the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead can dwell inside of me. And I can be raised to life both here on this earth and into eternity. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying right now. Thank you, Lord. I want you to bow your heads wherever you are. I want you to bow your heads right now. And I want you to begin to talk to God. While I've been preaching, there's been some areas that have come up in your thought process. They didn't just come up by accident, but they're areas that God wants to touch. He wants to minister to. He wants to heal. He wants to fix. He wants to save you from. There's areas that maybe your spouse don't even know that you're dealing with. There's areas that, that maybe your children don't have any idea of, or, or maybe your parents don't have any idea of. God wants to touch that. He wants to fill you with his spirit, and then he wants to heal that. I want you to know this morning, don't waste an Easter Sunday just following the routines of Easter of years past. But instead, make today the Easter that saves your spirit and soul. Renew your life in Christ right now. Why don't you just raise your hands with me right now. They sit fix in the same just raise your hands with me right now. Father, we invite you to invade our world. God, we need the Holy Ghost right now. Uh, oh, fill us with your spirit to overflowing, God. God, we commit everything in our life to you. Oh, you might be somewhere today and say, I want to be baptized. If you'll just private message me or send a message on Facebook, I'll meet you one on one. I'll baptize you. I'll help you to find your way in Christ. I'll help you to find your way to an old-fashioned altar where you can have your life changed and transformed and made whole and made new. I plead with you this morning, don't let Easter pass by and not be made new in the Spirit of God. That same Spirit that dwells in Him can dwell in you today. Hallelujah. Let's worship together right now. Thank you, Lord.